And we are going to get started here. So for our last and a final presenter for today, we are going to hear from Dr. Deanna Diebold, who is an assistant professor at University of Minnesota, Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine. Her special interests are in pulmonary and sleep complications of neuromuscular diseases. So I will turn it over to you and thank you for being here. We already have a couple questions for you. So this has been oh. a popular subject <laughs> earlier today. So I will let you go ahead and present your slides. All right, let's see if I can do this. And great. Right. Um, so like Nicole said, my name's Deanna Diebold. I am a pulmonary critical care sleep specialist. And for the past, oh, 15 years or so, I've had sort of a special interest in uh, where pulmonary sleep and neuromuscular conditions intersect. Um, so we're going to start by differentiating a little bit between daytime sleepiness and fatigue. Now, obviously, there's overlap between these two definitions, but daytime sleepiness is how you see this guy on the left here, um, propensity to doze off to fall asleep when you don't want to, whereas fatigue is more uh, described as a feeling of tiredness or exhaustion. Again, there's lots of overlap. We are going to focus on daytime sleepiness. So the first thing we want to do is measure the sleepiness. Um, and there are a number of different ways to do this. The first we'll talk about is sleepiness scores. So there are a number of sleepiness scores. Probably the most common one is the Epworth sleepiness scale seen here. Um, on the right, and that is sort of a questionnaire that is filled out by patient or caregiver um, rating how likely it is that that person would fall asleep in a certain situation. So sitting and reading, watching television, sitting inactive in a public space, all the way down to in a car while as the driver of the car while stopped for a few minutes in traffic. Um, and so then you zero, one, two, or three, uh, no chance to a high chance of falling asleep. And then you add up those numbers. So the score can range from zero to 24. Um, and obviously the higher the score, the more subjectively sleepy a person is. Um, they've sort of set a little bit of an arbitrary cutoff as 10 being a normal Epworth sleepiness scale, although you could argue that that's actually even a little bit high. The Karolinska, Stanford, and Toronto are sort of all more versions of what you see down on the bottom here. So just sort of rating like one to nine or 10 or whatever the number is, how alert are you? So the Epworth is a little bit more in depth and like I said, used more frequently. Uh, moving on to another way that we can measure sleepiness. This is also somewhat subjective, but gets a little bit more uh, details about it. Um, this is a two-week sleep diary, and each day has a line, and each line is divided into 24 hours. And so the person would take this home, and every day, um, this starts at noon, would mark, do you exercise? That's high, you know, highlighted with an E. Did you have any alcohol? The shaded bars are when you were asleep, at least when you thought you were asleep. Um, and then C is caffeine, M is medicine. This little hash mark is when this person went to bed. So I went to bed about 10 o'clock and then felt like he or she fell asleep at midnight. And so when you get these back all filled out, um, you get a little bit of an idea of what the person's schedule is. Do they keep a fairly regular schedule? Are they napping a lot? Are they, you know, are they sleeping throughout the night? As a supplement to the sleep diary, we sometimes will get actigraphy. So this is a picture of an actigraph watch. The person wears it on their wrist for usually two weeks while they are doing the sleep diary. Um, and when a person is moving, there's little piezoelectric crystals in here that register that movement. And then when a person is sleeping, they're not moving. And so the piezoelectric crystals are silent and you don't get a bar. So here's what an actigraph printout looks like. This is actually only one, two, three, four days of an actigraph. So usually you would get more information back. So here's where it started. And this person is up goes to bed about 10 o'clock. There's a little thing on the side where you can mark 
and that mark is when that person went to bed. And then the actograph sort of fills in. You can see they're mostly asleep during this blue thing. So starting maybe about, I don't know, what is that, 11 o'clock fell asleep and got up at six and then also marked that he or she got up at six. So this, like I said, is a little bit more objective data to supplement the information that was provided by the patient for the sleep diaries to get a sense of how much is this person sleeping, how regular is the sleep, um, how restful is the sleep. Sometimes you will see, you know, big gaps of insomnia in the middle of the night um, or very long sleep time. So that can, can be very helpful. We don't often do multiple sleep latency tests, but that's um, another way to sort of objectively measure sleepiness. So these are done in a sleep lab, and we'll talk a little bit more later about what sleep studies entail. Um, but to do an MSLT, you would have an in-lab sleep study prior to the sleep latency test. So you'd sleep the night before in the sleep lab. Um, you would have to be found not to have sleep apnea or any other sleep disordered breathing. Um, if you did, the sleep latency test would be canceled and we'd focus on treating that. Um, we always test, do drug testing, pretty much always do drug testing for multiple sleep latency tests. Um, you know, if a person has not reported that they're taking narcotics and narcotics show up on the drug test, that's something to, to talk about. That might be part of why you're sleepy. Um, obviously, if you have prescription narcotics, that's also going to show up, but that's something that's already known and not, uh, not has already been taken into account. So anyway, you do, you wake up from your sleep study and then you stick around and you have four or five naps during the day, each of which is two hours apart. So you wake up, you have your breakfast, and two hours later, they put you into a room and turn off the lights and say, fall asleep. And they are monitoring your EEG, your brain waves during this nap. And they leave you in there until 20 minutes has elapsed or until you fall asleep. If you fall asleep, then you are left to sleep for no longer than 15 minutes before they wake you up. And then either at the end of, at the end of whatever period it is, then you wait another two hours until the next nap. So it takes obviously a big chunk of a day. The measurement is the time to sleep onset averaged over four to five naps. So if you never fall asleep during those naps, your sleep onset latency is 20 minutes, which is actually pretty long. Normal is 10, averaged over those four naps. Um, and if you fall asleep within the first minute on each of those naps, then that's very clear data that you have excessive sleepiness. So we have said, okay, this person with myotonic dystrophy is sleepy, right? Based on the Epworth score, based on sleep diaries and or actigraphy, probably not a multiple sleep latency test, but let's just say we did it. They're very sleepy. So what are the causes? Um, the main cause that I'm gonna talk about today, partly because I'm a pulmonologist, partly because this is something that is number one, very important to treat because it can be dangerous to your health if left untreated. And number two, important to treat because we actually have good effective treatment for it is sleep disordered breathing. So difficulties with breathing when you are trying to sleep. Um, restless leg syndrome is a fairly common cause of daytime sleepiness in myotonic dystrophy, and we'll touch a little bit on that. Um, myotonic dystrophy, as you probably know, is associated with sleepiness sometimes in and of itself, so-called idiopathic hypersomnia, which is a fancy way of saying a person's really sleepy and we don't know why. Um, there are some treatments for this, but it's not nearly as effective as some of the other ones. Um, I'm not going to talk at all about poor sleep due to pain. I'm sure that that is an issue. That's just not my area of expertise, but that, you know, for sure is something that a lot of people need addressed. So starting to talk about sleep disordered breathing or SDB in myotonic dystrophy. So it is the confluence of neuromuscular weakness plus sleep leading to problems. So neuromuscular weakness in and of itself is associated with 
reduced respiratory muscle strength, right? Reduced every muscle strength, but the respiratory muscles are part of that. Neuromuscular weakness is associated with loss of upper airway muscle tone. So even in people who don't have typical bulbar symptoms, like ALS has a lot of bulbar symptoms with slurred speech, even if you don't have that, you probably have some loss of tone of your upper airways. Um, some people with neuromuscular weakness have a tendency towards obesity, most commonly because they might be confined to a wheelchair and it's very difficult to keep your weight optimized when you are unable to exert yourself and exercise. So that can be a layer of a problem associated with neuromuscular weakness. Scoliosis and chest wall deformities are very common in many forms of muscular dystrophy. Myotonic may be a little bit less so, but certainly a possibility. And that's because the muscles that are supposed to keep your abdomen and chest the right shape and size are weak. And so you end up with, with twisting and deformity and that impacts the breathing mechanics. And all of these lead to chronically elevated carbon dioxide levels um, because you are not breathing out that bad air. And that in turn leads people's brains to sort of reset. So a normal carbon dioxide level is 40. And if a person is uh, consistently much higher than that, the brain will sometimes say, will commonly say like, okay, hey, we're not gonna make 40, so let's just be satisfied with 45 or 50. And so that blunts the respiratory drive when that carbon dioxide has been elevated for so long because the brain actually changes its goal of carbon dioxide level. So those are the factors from neuromuscular um, weakness. Sleep in and of itself, even in people with no neuromuscular disorder, sleep is associated with a reduced ventilatory drive. So during sleep, all of our carbon dioxide set points are a little bit higher than they would be otherwise. So you start with a high one and then you fall asleep and it goes a little bit higher and that can run you into trouble. Um, all of us during sleep have some loss of our upper airway muscle tone. This is what it contributes to obstructive sleep apnea um, very commonly. It's just our airways get floppy when we sleep, even when they're not floppy during waking time. All of us during sleep have some reduction in our respiratory pump function, um, especially during REM sleep. It is normal during REM sleep um, for us to be paralyzed from the neck down. So we are you, we don't want to be acting out our dreams. You know, probably if you're dreaming that you're running and you're trying to run and you can't run, that's because you are literally paralyzed during REM sleep, except for your diaphragms. And so when your diaphragms are normal and strong, that's no problem. You can still get the good air in and the bad air out during sleep without any help from the rest of your muscles. But if your diaphragms are weak from myotonic dystrophy or from anything else, that plus the paralysis of the other muscles can cause a big problem. And then most people sleep not necessarily supine. Supine means sort of on your back, but you sleep flat. And so instead of gravity helping to move your diaphragms because you're sitting up, gravity is actually working against your diaphragms. And so that adds to the risk of hypoventilation and breathing problems during sleep. So I talk to patients a lot about symptoms of sleep disordered breathing in myotonic dystrophy or other neuromuscular disorders. They are often very subtle. Um, I don't know if, you guys have heard the analogy of the frog that you put into cool water and then turn the heat on and the frog won't jump out because he sort of doesn't realize that the water is boiling until it's too late. Um, as opposed to if you put the frog in the boiling water, he'll jump right out. And this is kind of how sleep disordered breathing can sneak up on somebody with neuromuscular condition. Um, very subtle, you sort of write, write off the symptoms to something else and all of a sudden you're in trouble. So one symptom that I hear a lot is more frequent awakenings. So somebody used to wake up one time at night to reposition or to get up and go to the bathroom and now they're waking up every hour 
they figure, well, it's just because my hip is sore. Well, maybe it's because you're having troubles breathing and that's waking you up. They might have increased sleep time. Somebody who used to only need six, seven hours and would feel great during the day, now all of a sudden needs 10, 11 hours and still has, I abbreviated here, EDS, excessive daytime sleepiness, um, despite feeling like they're sleeping at night. Um, that can be a symptom of sleep disordered breathing. Morning headaches and confusion tend to be later symptoms. Those are from the elevated carbon dioxide level. Excuse me. Um, I mean, everybody is somewhat confused when they first wake up, you know, maybe a couple of minutes of rubbing your eyes and shaking your head and waking up. But people with hypoventilation at night um, can have that confusion for 20, 30 minutes where they're just not clearing um, until they breathe off that CO2 and start to think clearly again. And that can really be a sign that you need to do something about your breathing at night. One of the early signs that I love because it can be so helpful is what's called orthopnea. So that's the medical term for feeling short of breath if you try to lay flat. And I am constantly amazed at how many people just, they have that symptom and they sort of fix it themselves by they sleep in a recliner or they sleep in their chair or they buy a hospital bed and they prop it way up. And unless I ask them, this has become their new normal and they just sort of fixed it and made it all better and they forgot to mention it. And that can be a, a very clear sign that something's going on breathing wise and needs to be treated. I mean, that's actually sort of treating it, sleeping in the recliner, but it would be better to treat it with, with the BiPAP, which is what we'll talk about. Um, daytime shortness of breath is relatively rare. So many people, by the time they are this week, they probably are limited in terms of their walking by their leg muscles or in terms of carrying things by their arm muscles. And so they've already compensated um, for that and they don't actually feel short of breath during the day or at night, except for this orthopnea. So after we've taken a history and thought about it, um, now it's time to maybe do some testing. Um, one of the most common things we test in all muscular dystrophies, myotonic included obviously, is pulmonary function testing. So you can see this woman here has a little mouthpiece and she's told to take a big breath, put her lips over the mouthpiece and blow, 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 blow. And then this is measuring Mostly in muscular dystrophy, it's measuring the amount of volume in your lungs that comes out over the course of that six second blow. Um, all of these numbers are standardized for your gender, age, and height. So the taller you are, the more lung you should have. The closer to 30 years old you are, that's kind of where your lung function maxima or maxes out the then the more lung function you should have and so all of these are uh, expressed in terms of a percent predicted um, and when your forced vital capacity drops below 50 percent of the predicted value you are much more likely to have developed sleep disordered breathing and we start to pay closer and closer attention to all of those symptoms and and uh, questionnaires that uh, that we talked about just a minute ago um, and so many MDA clinics will do this once a year, um, you know, sooner if you have symptoms, but yearly to just sort of track the progress. And that's one of the main reasons for doing that. Another test that I get very frequently is overnight oximetry. So here's a picture of an overnight oximeter. It's pretty slick. The little thing goes on your finger and registers the oxygen saturation. The monitor sits on your wrist like this, so you're not attached to anything at the side of the bed. It records continuously while you are comfortably sleeping in your own bed, records your oxygen saturations continuously. Um, and then it, it, it doesn't beep, it doesn't wake you up. It's, it's super slick. And then you can print them out and look at them. And here is a couple of examples of overnight oximetry. So here's a normal one. Um, and you can see here's the oxygen saturation. 100% is perfect. 90% is perfectly adequate. And if we start at, what is this, about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10, 11, 12, through the night, there are slight variations. That's totally normal. In fact, you even get 
in normal sleep, you'll get pretty close to 90% saturation just because we all hypoventilate, but you never dip below. This is perfectly fine. Contrast that with somebody who's very abnormal. Again, here's the oxygen saturation. Here's 100%. This person is starting at a little below 90%, right? And then probably this is a period of REM sleep where you lose everything except for your diaphragm and you have significant hypoventilation, right? So here you're down in the high 50s percent. Come back up when you are out of REM sleep, sleep a little bit longer. Here you're down to 45%. And so this is something that even in the absence of symptoms, I would say, oh my goodness, we need to do something about this person's sleep disordered breathing. So I try to get these overnight oximetry tests at least every couple of years. Um, they can be a little bit hard to get. Um, they are not very well reimbursed. Um, and so a lot of the equipment companies don't love doing them. They'll sort of ignore the faxes until they can't ignore them anymore. Um, my clinic has actually purchased a couple of these, uh, these units. They're not that expensive. Um, and so they're pretty slick. There's obviously a little bit of administrative cost, but um, it works pretty well and it gives a lot of good information. So the sort of gold standard for sleep disordered breathing is a polysomnogram or a sleep study. And these get us a ton of information, which is really nice. They are expensive and they are a bit of a pain. You have to go to a sleep center. This is like we talked about with the multiple sleep latency test. Um, and they hook you up to all this stuff. So you have an EEG, multiple EEG electrodes to monitor your brain activity because that's how we tell if you're awake or you're asleep and which stage of sleep you're in. You have a little nasal cannula underneath your nose hooking around your ear and that doesn't blow oxygen and it monitors the airflow. Um, there's a microphone that sort of sits on your neck that records if you're snoring or not. There's a belt that wraps around your upper abdomen, lower chest, and that monitors whether your chest is moving in and out, whether you have muscle activity breathing. And then you have electrodes on your arms and legs that also monitor muscle movements. This sort of gets at the restless leg syndrome question, but they are, you know, they are there. And so you're in an unfamiliar bed and you've got all this stuff going and you've got a camera on you because they're watching you. <laughs> by the camera, um, and then they tell you to go to sleep, um, which uh, surprisingly enough, actually many people do fall asleep during sleep studies, but they're, they're involved. And so honestly, I don't get them super often in my neuromuscular patients um, because they're, uh, they are involved and they're even more involved if you have mobility issues. Um, if you have a PCA that needs to be with you, because there's no place for the PCA to sleep a lot of the time. Um, so they can be very helpful, but they are not without their downsides. If you get a polysomnogram, you get all this information. So this, you, the, the other two squiggle lines were the whole night. This is 30 seconds of data. So these top lines are the EEG, the brain waves. Then you've got some EMG. Those are telling you what the muscles are doing in the chin and the leg. Um, you've got the airflow from the nasal prongs. You've got, oh, I forgot you have ECG leads, electrocardiogram. So this is your heartbeat. And then here are the breathing, the breaths in and out. So again, this is 30 seconds. So you just get volumes and volumes of data. Again, very helpful, very involved, can drill down and sometimes, um, sometimes needed. So we get all this information and let's say it's been determined, okay, this person needs help, needs help breathing. So we tend not to use CPAP. So CPAP stands for continuous positive airway pressure. It's just one pressure that's pushing air into your lungs the whole time, breath cycle, just continuously. It's good for people with obstructive sleep apnea because it will splint open an airway that has a tendency to collapse. And people with obstructive sleep apnea with strong muscles can breathe in and out despite having air being pushed in continuously. BiPAP gives you a higher level with inspiration and then it releases to allow for exhalation. And so that 
in general is much better for people with significant neuromuscular weakness because it will provide support to the respiration. It will it kind of actually breathes for you while you sleep. For people with very weak muscles, you know, I said CPAP is probably contraindicated. It, depending on how weak you are, it, it is definitely contraindicated because it, it can run you into worsening problems with uh, elevated CO2 levels, um, especially if your force vital capacity is really, really low in the, you know, 20, 30% predicted range. So we tend to use BiPAP. We tend not to use oxygen. So like I mentioned, muscle weakness can cause hypoventilation. So it is more a problem of getting the bad air out than it is getting oxygen in. Our lungs are so efficient at exchanging oxygen um, that you can be pretty bad off and still have good oxygen exchange. The carbon dioxide is a little bit dicier. And so if you're borderline on the oxygen and your carbon dioxide is not checked and you get started on oxygen to fix that problem, you can run into a lot of problems with carbon dioxide retention. Um, so we tend not to use oxygen if at all possible. Now there are certain situations where it's been determined that that's the only thing we've got, that you know, a person can't tolerate BiPAP and we're just gonna use oxygen, but it is not ideal and should not be the first line of treatment in people with neuromuscular conditions. So talking about BiPAP, look at all these happy people wearing their BiPAP masks. So the good thing is, that it helps you breathe and sleep at the same time. It can prevent bad complications and it can make you feel much, much better. The bad thing is, nose and mouth or just over your nose or underneath your nose. Um, and it straps up over your head and then there's a hose that attaches to a machine at the bedside table that pushes air in and kind of helps breathe for you. So uh, there's, a, there's a discomfort and sometimes people feel very claustrophobic, although in my experience, a lot of people, especially those who are having problems with this, the, oh my gosh, I can sleep and breathe at the same time feeling wins out over the, oh my gosh, I've got this thing on my face that's bugging me. And people pretty quickly get used to this whole business. So here's the side that's by you. And then here's the machine that sits on your bedside table. So this is a BiPAP machine. Um, you can see it's pretty small and compact. There's a little humidity function that you can fill with distilled water. Um, and then the tubing and it plugs in and it's pretty slick. This is an example of a fancier machine. This particular one is the Respironics Trilogy, although there are other brands. And you can see it's a bit bigger. Um, sometimes it comes on a stand and some, you know, it's, it's a little bit more unwieldy. Uh, the benefit to this is that it, it has a battery. Um, so if you lose power with this, you're out of luck. If you lose power with this, you have sometimes up to eight hours um, that the battery will work. And this just has more bells and whistles and can do way more. So for people who have sort of minor problems, this will work pretty well. Um, as you get weaker and need more support, we often will change over to a bigger trilogy type machine. And so BiPAP stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. NIV, which you'll see, stands for non-invasive ventilation. So this actually could also, in certain circumstances, function as a ventilator. But instead of being invasively ventilated through a tracheostomy tube, this person has just the mask, which is non-invasive. Because there's, yeah. So the benefits are huge. Um, people sleep better. They're actually, you know, instead of constantly waking up to try to breathe, because one question I get is, am I just going to stop breathing and die? And the answer is no, your body is just too smart to let that happen. But what happens is your body sacrifices the sleep and makes you feel terrible because you're not sleeping. So you have improved quality of sleep. You rest your chronically fatigued respiratory muscles. Um, so the, 
you know, instead of having to work all night, these muscles that have been doing such hard work during the day can just relax, let the machine do it. And so you actually sometimes even get an improvement in the force vital capacity. Now, of course, myotonic dystrophy is progressive and that improvement will get worse over time, but it actually improve, can improve muscle function during the day, respiratory muscle function during the day. You can get increased compliance of the respiratory symptom or system. Um, if you're never taking a very big breath, you can get what we call contractures, where your bones and muscles and cartilage sort of shrink. And if you are regularly inflating your lungs with the non-invasive ventilator or BiPAP, um, that will improve. You can get improved what we call pulmonary toilet, <laughs> which is the ability to cough stuff up. You're getting air down to the lower parts of your lungs and that can help mobilize secretions and you can cough better. You're going to get improved sensitivity to that hypercapnia or elevated CO2 levels because you're not going to have those chronically elevated CO2 levels so your brain sensors will actually reset. And you're not going to have those low oxygen levels. So you're going to have, you know, reduced cardiovascular consequences. You can imagine that those oxygen saturations of 45, 50%, even though they're fairly brief, those are hard on a person and they're hard on a person's heart. And that can add to some of the things that are going on already in myotonic dystrophy. So the benefits are huge. Um, so if you get one thing out of this, it's that nocturnal non-invasive ventilation when you need it, which is not for everyone. You don't need it in the earlier stages, but as a person gets weaker and older, they oftentimes need this and it can be hugely helpful. All right, we're gonna move on and talk about uh, the second thing, uh, restless leg syndrome. So this is a syndrome uh, where people feel that their legs are restless, hence the name. Um, these are a bunch of, um, descriptive terms that real people came up with to describe this feeling. It's very difficult to describe. Sometimes it can be pain. Sometimes people will think that it's spasm. Sometimes you feel like there's insects crawling beneath your skin. Sometimes it feels hot. It's just this very uncomfortable feeling in your legs. They're more prominent, these, feel, these symptoms towards evening, generally speaking, and they get much better if you get up and move around which is great if you can do that. It's not so great if you don't have the ability to do that or if you're trying to go to sleep at night um, or if you're sitting in a theater trying to watch a movie. So uh, it, can be, it can be a problem. Um, restless leg syndrome, sorry, I didn't put this in, but it's, it's diagnosed mostly clinically. So mostly we just talk to people about their symptoms. Um, if we go back to the sorry, polysomnogram. So these electrodes that monitor movements can detect what's called periodic limb movements of sleep. And so if a person has restless leg syndrome symptoms and PLMs, periodic limb movements, that's sort of the gold standard diagnostic criteria for restless leg syndrome. You don't have to have PLMs to be diagnosed with RLS. If you have restless leg syndrome, the most important thing to do is get your ferritin level checked to make sure you are not iron deficient. Um, partly because you don't want to be iron deficient, partly because treating iron deficiency is so effective at treating restless leg syndrome. Um, so you can, if, if you have low iron levels, you can take iron supplements. Those can sometimes be difficult to take. GI symptoms are common. For people who are taking iron supplements, you can actually get IV iron. It's super effective. So if you have this, that's very important. There are various home remedies. The most common ones, warm bath. Um, if you can do moderate exercise, although you want to do it early in the day because either vigorous exercise or late in the day can actually worsen restless leg syndrome. Um, and you should avoid caffeine probably generally if you have this badly. Um, sedating antihistamines, um, these are very common sleep medications. So diphenhydramine, which goes under the um, trade name Benadryl, but it's also Tylenol PM. Um, that medication can uh, worsen restless leg syndrome. Melatonin might make it worse. So if you're taking that to help you sleep and you have restless leg syndrome, consider stopping the melatonin. Um, and there are certain classes of antidepressants that may make it worse. Um, certainly if you are taking an antidepressant and have RLS, 
don't stop it without talking to your doctor, but that is something to consider. So how do we treat restless leg syndrome besides those things? Um, uh, so there are certain medications that are specifically prescribed for it, most commonly dopamine agonists. So these stimulate dopamine. Um, Ropinaril, Pramipexil, and roto Rotigotine. Anyway, those are the generic names and here are the brand names. Um, these can be very effective. However, they are not without problems. So there's two big problems. One is augmentation which is where the first couple of weeks or couple of months that you take these medications, you feel great. And then your symptoms start coming back and then they come back and they're starting earlier in the day and you're having to increase the dose, increase the dose, increase the dose. And that's augmentation and that's a big problem. If you get it, it's not super common, but it can be a big problem. And then the other thing is that in a small category of people, these medications cause, um, disinhibition. So people who used to like to go to Las Vegas but could control their gambling instincts will all of a sudden just not be able to stop on the slot machines um, or they're shopping all the time or they're not manic behavior but just behavior that's not very adaptive that the person would like to not do and this may be the cause. So again they're very effective. We use them with a lot of caution largely because of the risk of the augmentation and these disinhibition symptoms that they can cause. The calcium channel modifiers like Neurontin and Lyrica are less effective but can be used. Um, the main side effects of both of these are sleepiness, although if they're taken at bedtime or, you know, kind of when the RLS symptoms happen, it's not, that's not such a big problem. Um, narcotics are very effective, however, they are habit forming and we don't like to prescribe them unless absolutely necessary. And then sedatives such as Valium or Ativan can be used also very effective, habit forming. And basically the idea with especially the sedatives is that you just knock a person out and they sleep through it. So you can argue about whether that's a great idea or not. So we'll talk just briefly about idiopathic hypersomnia, um, which again, idiopathic means we don't know why it is happening and hypersomnia means you're too tired. So fancy word, kind of a garbage bag diagnosis. It's super common in myotonic dystrophy and it can be miserable. It's up to 30% of people with myotonic dystrophy have some degree of idiopathic hypersomnia. And here might be an example of actigraphy for somebody who has this. So here's normal actigraphy, right? You go to bed at 11 and you wake up at seven and you feel pretty good and you don't nap during the day. Here's somebody with just super long sleep times and maybe there's a nap here that didn't manage to get colored in blue. Maybe there's a nap here. You're just tired all the time and you're sleeping all the time. People have described this as overwhelming sleepiness. Um, when you first wake up, when you have idiopathic hypersomnia, not even when you first wake up. So sleep doesn't really make it better because you have this sleep drunkenness where you're just so tired um, when you wake up. You might have cognitive problems or memory loss during the day. It is a diagnosis of exclusion, right? That's part of the idiopathic part. We want to make sure that there's not some other reason why you're so tired. Um, and it's treated with lifestyle modifications. Um, you know, you, you aren't going to be able to work a 12 hour job because you're too tired to do that. Or, you know, you're going to have to work a nap into your day. Um, stimulants can help um, and they do help, but they are, they don't turn you back into a quote unquote normal person in terms of your level of fatigue. Um, and, and the stimulants can be habit forming, but they are better and better. So I, I would, uh, if you have this, it would be worth talking to your doctor about it. So conclusions, sleepiness is common in myotonic dystrophy. A um, couple of different uh, potential causes. It's super important to evaluate for sleep disorder breathing, partly because it's dangerous if it's untreated, but partly because it is treatable and we can help people with this symptom or with this syndrome. Uh, restless leg syndrome may contribute. Uh, there are some effective treatments available. Um, and uh, if you have a component of it, just idiopathic hypersomnia that may respond to stimulants. And that is the end of my slide presentation and I will take questions.
All right. Well, we have some for sure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, all right. This person has um, type 1 um, MMD. They use a BiPAP supplemented with 71 p.m. oxygen. Would taking a sleep aid be helpful? Um, presuming this person is having difficulty sleeping while on the BiPAP. Um, so the answer to that is possibly. Okay. Um, so if you are hypoventilating when you sleep and we just prescribe you a sleep aid without the BiPAP, that can be dangerous because we're just sort of turning off your natural mechanism that would wake you up to breathe. Okay. But if we are prescribing that to help you tolerate the BiPAP, then it actually can be helpful. The idea being that if we sort of knock you out while you're on the BiPAP, while you're getting used to that, you know, sort of during the hopefully just couple of months that you're getting used to it, mm -hmm. that can actually be super beneficial and is safe as long as you're wearing the BiPAP after, while you're sleeping after you took the sedative. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. If it doesn't, I'm going to tell that person to type in another part of okay. the question. And what that <laughs> Sounds good. Should. Sounds good. Um, can sleep apnea become worse over time with DM1? Initial tests showed that they had a mild obstructive sleep apnea for her. Um, and on the second part of that, what are your thoughts on the Inspire implant? So um, sleep apnea absolutely can get worse. Um, I sort of joke, everything gets worse when you get older, once you're <laughs> about 30. So, I mean, yeah, it's going to get worse. Um, the Inspire is, it's a little electrode that is implanted in your neck muscles, and then it's attached to sort of like a pacemaker thing that stimulates that. So that is good for people who have just obstructive sleep apnea, some people who have just obstructive sleep apnea, without the rest of the muscle weakness. So that would not fix hypoventilation. If a person has myotonic dystrophy with a reduced force vital capacity and risk for hypoventilation, the Inspire wouldn't do anything. Okay. Um, what about recommendations for any masks? Um, this person has muscle control around her mouth. She has issues with that. And um, she said some of these are just like a mouth torture for her. So she was left to return the device. Do you have any other options that might be available for someone who is having problems with? Oh, so there are, right. The, that can be a problem for sure. And sometimes the answer is that there isn't a mask that is comfortable. Okay. There are some um, that are more fabric-y that people can manage to get a seal with. Mm -hmm. There are some that go over the whole face, like over the forehead and under the chin, that depending on this person's, um, you know, pro uh, yeah. difficulties might yeah, be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I don't have like one magical mask that works for everyone, unfortunately. Okay. Um. This person had a change in providers and the new sleep specialist has taken them off their AFAPs and has them on BiPAP with a ST backup. She's concerned that this is actually appropriate given the central part of the apnea. It's probably okay. As long as you have a, an ST backup, um, okay. that probably is okay. okay. Yeah. This person yawns four to six times a minute. Um, this wow. can last anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. Is this idiopathic? It could be, um, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion again. And so you should get, you know, go see somebody and get tested for other stuff because it could be other stuff too. I do not have daytime sleepiness um, and fall asleep easily at night, but I wake up around 3 a.m. and can't get back to sleep. They usually wake up with some sort of a headache um, for about 10 minutes in that morning. Do you think they could potentially have SBD or SDB, sorry? SD, yeah, right. I sometimes <laughs> fix that up too. Um, absolutely could. Okay. Yep. yep. Should, should talk to your doctor about it and get tested. All right. Yep. Um, I have CPAP for mild sleep apnea. They checked um, CO2 in my blood and said it was fine. So I didn't need a BiPAP, but she's noticed that she's drooling a lot more lately. How would she know if she needs a BiPAP? Um, excellent question. So watching for some of those symptoms, drooling isn't a common symptom that I would worry about. I mean, it makes it hard to wear the mask, but I wouldn't worry about that per se. But the oh. can't breathe when you lay flat, 
waking up more frequently, tired during the day despite sleeping and wearing the CPAP. And then the other super important thing is the forced vital capacity. So if you're on CPAP and your forced vital capacity is over 50% predicted, 50% predicted, you're and you don't have those symptoms, you're probably okay. Okay. So usually those get checked once a year, I think. Okay. Um, and so just, you should kind of know what that is and watch for that 50% mark. Okay. Um, what about using a Trilogy sleep machine for DM1 patients? Would you recommend that? Yes, I use it a ton. I love it. That was that blue box, the, okay. the Respironics Trilogy. Yep. Okay. Um, how common is it that a pulmonologist would recommend the use of an oxygen concentrator while using the BiPAP at night? Um, reasonably commonly. So when, okay. if we're using the BiPAP, then often I'll do that overnight oximetry again. Okay. And if the oxygen levels still haven't come up, sometimes we will have to bleed in oxygen to the BiPAP. We don't use, we try not to use oxygen without the BiPAP, but it's not super on, it, it's reasonably common to need oxygen with the BiPAP. Okay. Okay. Uh... This person's used a CPAP for about 15 years. She's wondering if she should use a BiPAP instead and get regular CO2 levels tested. Um, you could get regular CO2 levels tested or the forced vital capacity. And okay. if you're feeling good and it's greater than 50%, you're probably okay on the okay. CPAP. Um, one of these questions we had actually when, um, I believe it was Dr. Sampson was speaking, and I'm going to scroll up here. Um, what is the difference between pro Provigil and Nuvigil. Different companies making the their own brand to try to make money. Okay. <laughs> That's my cynical report. They're very similar. They're okay. both stimulants used for idiopathic hypersomnia and okay. work very similarly. Okay. Um, if you're diagnosed with narcolepsy, would that be inaccurate if you have DM? Or could you, you could also have narcolepsy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you could. It's not super common, but there's no reason why you couldn't have it. This person no, has super uh, common association. Sorry. No, okay. This person has DM1. She said she had a sleep study, and they put her on put her on a CPAP. Could she have been misdiagnosed? I'm still tired all the time and easily sleep 10 to 12 hours. Um. So yes, you should make sure that the sleep lab and sleep doctor in question are reasonably well versed in neuromuscular conditions uh -huh. okay um because not all are yeah so i would talk to your neurologist or find a specialist that knows something about neuromuscular okay um this person says that um their brother uses asap with oxygen do they need to worry about co2 levels with an asap an asap what is that i don't a if is she it, can reiterate, maybe AVAPS. What, maybe she wrote ASAP. Maybe she meant AVAPS. AVAP. Yeah, maybe meant AVAPS. AVAPS is a it, it's a mode on that trilogy. Okay. Um, that sort of guarantees a volume rather than guaranteeing a pressure, and so it, it's a nice way to guarantee ventilation. So if this person is on an AVAPS machine, they should be good. Okay. All right. Um. What's the best position to sleep? Whatever's the most comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you, so for people, so I guess the only time I tell people to try to position themselves is if I think they are having trouble with sleep disordered breathing and they cannot slash will not wear a BiPAP. Mm -hmm. And then upright positioning will help. You know, get a hospital bed, prop yourself way up, and that'll partially help. Okay. This person was, um, this is diagnosis gene repetition 57 on a CPAP. Still feel like I have to remember to sleep at night or have difficulty filling lungs, waking up more tired than when I went to sleep. Do you think I might want to switch to a BiPAP? Potentially, yeah. Okay. Um, um, this person's um, son has central sleep apnea and could not get used to the BiPAP airflow at all. He's been prescribed the CPAP um, instead with continuous airflow. Can this be um, contradicted as his mouth 
breathed, his mouth breath has difficulty with masks. And his daytime sleepiness prevents him to, from functioning without long naps. So, sorry, so has okay. central sleep apnea, which is a little bit of a different thing. And okay. using a CPAP for central sleep apnea? Uh-huh, that's what they're using. And that- He couldn't get used to it. Okay, so it isn't using anything for the central sleep apnea and very tired during the day. Yeah, he was prescribed a CPAP instead with okay. continuous airflow. Um, but he is a mouth breather and has difficulty with all mass. His daytime yeah. sleep prevents functioning. So she just didn't know, you know, if, is there another option? Yeah, there, so I guess the, so the only other thing for central sleep apnea, there's a thing called ASV, which I guess I wonder now that, that whether that thing that I, ASAP, yeah, yeah, was that ASV. <laughs> so that's, that's a mode of, of PAP that's used for central sleep apnea. Okay. Um, but it, in, but it entails a mask. So okay. her son might still have problems with that. How often should you check your CO2 levels? Is that a daily thing? Or no, a, no, okay. no. They're a bit difficult to check. So okay. I don't actually check them all that often in people, okay. but maybe every six or 12 months, potentially. Okay. Um, you can usually tell if somebody's retaining carbon dioxide. Okay. So what are those, what are those signs? Uh, the confusion, the headaches. Um, okay. my, so my screening tests are the overnight oximetry and the um, the questions, and sure. the uh, force vital capacity. Okay. What are your thoughts on taking GHB? I don't know what that. Ah, uh, GHB is uh, the colloquial the date rape drug. That's a treatment for narcolepsy, um, oh. and it it completely knocks people out. It can be used medically. I have literally never prescribed it. Okay. I don't, I don't usually treat narcolepsy and that's the only indication. That's the only FDA approved indication I'm aware of. Okay. Um, this person has a DM1. They're on a CPAP. Are there some things to watch for that may indicate I need to go back for re-evaluation or move to BiPAP? Um, the symptoms of not sleeping well on your CPAP and the force vital capacity less than 50% predicted. Okay. If you have obstructive sleep apnea, can sleeping on your side help? Mm-hmm. Yep, okay. it can. Um, I have type 2 and I was borderline. How often should I be tested? Sorry, so borderline, like borderline type 2, not very, I'm going not to very affected. With, yeah, I'm going to go with that. Okay, okay. <laughs> Again, if there's um, something else, please type it in. Yeah, how often should you get tested? I mean, probably not every year if it's normal, 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 normal. Every couple, three years. Okay. Ish. Okay. Um, um, should you be tested for apnea annually? Less than optimal results from the pulmonary test last year. I was tested for apnea at the same time and did not have that affliction. Um, so... I, so sorry, less than optimal tests on the pulmonary function, then what I would do would be the overnight oximetry. Okay. Okay. Um, how do you stop burping while on the trilogy? Is that possible? <laughs> um, different mask, um, okay. different position. Yeah. Sometimes it'll push air into your stomach and that can be problematic. Okay. Okay. Um, have you ever prescribed, have you prescribed um, flumenz flumenzanil? Flumazanil, flumazanil is, um, I have to look that up. Okay. <laughs> is that Ambien? What is flumazanil? Oh, no. uh, exactly. Let me escape here. Not often, obviously. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. That's so funny. Flumazanil. I can't remember the trade name of that. Um, uh oh. No. Oh yeah, uh, that's what it is. Yeah. So that is uh, that reverses the effect of um, Valium. Okay. So so if you're if you've overdosed on a narcotic, we use Narcan. Probably lots of people have heard of Narcan. Sure, sure. And if somebody's overdosed on Valium, boy, this came out probably 20 years ago. Flumazenil was going to be like the Narcan of Valium. Uh huh. It doesn't, it doesn't really work all that okay. well. Um, 
So I've never prescribed it. I didn't even know you okay. could prescribe it. Okay. We used to use it a little bit in the hospital, but not very much anymore. Okay. Um, a couple more, and then I know we're at the end of our day here. This person says they have had a sleep study and have been diagnosed with sleep apnea. I've tried a BiPAP machine and have problems with my ears popping as well as severe buildup mucus in my throat, which prevents me from breathing. Can you give me some recommendations to help with these problems? Um, you know, potentially actually see an ear, nose, and throat doctor to see if there's something okay. sinusy that could be mm -hmm. done to stop with, to stop that. Yeah. That's a really good idea. Um, and, and then this person, that's our last question. It says, I have type one with both types of sleep apnea. I was not able to sleep with a BiPAP. So my doctor gave me a prescription for topramate, but it has given me insomnia. What do you suggest I do? So the Topamax to try to stimulate respiration. Uh -huh. um, what do I, uh, it sort of depends on how bad your sleep apnea is. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so on the one hand, we have great treatment, right? The BiPAP is great treatment. On the other hand, we have one treatment. <laughs> like if that doesn't work, the only thing we have is like, well, let's try a different mask or let's try yeah. slightly different settings or let's try a sedative so that you can tolerate it or potentially try using it a little bit during the day to get used to the mask so that you're not trying to sleep all at once. So I guess those would be the things I would say. Okay. Try harder with the BiPAP in some form. Sorry. Right. I don't have a good answer. Well, my goodness, this was such an informative session. I, we really went through a lot of questions and we had so many from this morning that we got answered. So thank you so much for your time today. And I really you appreciate you being with us today. All right. You bet. Thank Thanks. you. Take care. Bye-bye.